When the Lord Jesus created everything, everything was perfectly good. At this point, all angels were good. There were no demons just yet. Later, Lucifer had pride in his heart as the covering cherub, and he convinced one-third of all the angels to rebel with him. Lucifer and all the angels that sinned fell from heaven. Lucifer's name was changed to Satan, the accuser. Let's do a study and comparison of a perfectly good angel who has no sin and a demon who is full of sin. The good angel has all good in him. He has beauty, intelligence, love, wit, etc. These attributes, like beauty and intelligence, are good things in and of themselves. There is no mixture of good and bad with a good angel. A demon, on the other hand, is a mixture of good and evil. He has all the attributes of a good angel, but the, with sin added. He even loves to do evil. When you compare the two, you can see that the demon was once a good angel with sin added. Wait a second. Couldn't the demon be pure evil, just as the good angel is pure good? Well, no. You see, the demon has certain attributes that are good no matter how you see it. For example, a demon exists. A demon thinks, a demon has intelligence, a demon feels emotion, and the list goes on. Pure evil for this being would be not to exist, or even if you don't agree with that, you would have to say that intelligence taken away from a demon would make him worthless, even to himself. He would probably just sit in the corner and not think for an eternity. Even has something to sit on would be a good thing. This is purely logical. To give you another example, Suppose you were to compare two cars. You can tell that the first one is perfect, no scratches, new, shiny, etc. The second one looks just like the first one, but something's been added. The crash. Is it still the same car? Yes, but with an additional crash. Now remember that the good angel is like the perfect car, and the demon like the wrecked car. Does that make sense? But there's more. When the angels fell with Satan and they delved into sin, they turned desperately wicked. They realize that even though they are out on bail, so to speak, they know that their final destination is the lake of fire. So they have organized themselves to bring as many humans as they can with them. After all, misery loves company, especially in eternity. It seems like there are only three pleasures that demons have. Torturing humans in Hades and on earth. Deceiving humans into rejecting the Lord Jesus, who is the only way to heaven getting as many humans to join them in the lake of fire forever. Their reasoning is this, I will burn forever, but ha ha, I brought you here too. So since demons know where they're going, and it's an insane thought that's in their mind, they twisted and contorted their shapes into fearsome and hideous creatures. They're going to be as bad as they want to be. You see, angels, whether good or bad, can transform their shapes. Normally good angels have no need to transform their shapes. But demons use this ability all the time when dealing with humans on earth and in near-death experiences. This is your final eternal destiny. If you do not repent and follow the Lord Jesus. There is an alternative to this dreadful fate. You can follow the Lord Jesus. He commands, come, follow me. Luke 18.22 Seek the Lord while he may be found, call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways, and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on them, and to our God, for he will freely pardon. Isaiah 55, 6-7 The sinner's prayer is a Christian term for a prayer that is said when someone wants to repent of their sin. Ask God for forgiveness and state belief in the life, death, and saving resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Romans 10, 9-10 Millions have come to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ through church services, friends, and family leading them in a salvation prayer. However, it is not words that, in a prayer that save. Jesus Christ alone has the power to save through faith. J.D. Greer explains it well. 
It's not the prayer that saves. It's the repentance and faith behind the prayer that lays hold of salvation. My concern is that overemphasizing the prayer has often, though unintentionally, obscured the primary instruments for laying hold of salvation, repentance and faith. The example of a sinner prayer can help you communicate with God that you repent of your sins, turn away from your sins, accept his forgiveness, and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And the portion about Lord is very important because when you say Lord, you mean that he is your master. That means you will follow his commands. This is the sinner's prayer by Dr. Ray Prichard. Now this is just an example. You don't have to use these exact words, but it's a good example to help you. Lord Jesus, for too long I've kept you out of my life. I know that I'm a sinner and I cannot save myself. No longer will I close the door when I hear you knocking. By faith I gratefully receive your gift of salvation. I'm ready to trust you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming to earth. I believe you are the Son of God who died on the cross for my sins and rose from the dead on the third day. Thank you for bearing my sins and giving me the spirit of eternal life. I believe your words are true. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus, and be my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Next, you should follow it up with repentance, asking the Lord Holy Spirit to show you what the truth is, and try to find a good church and followers of Christ. If you liked what you see, hit the subscribe button or share. Thank you. This has been Immersus Tech.